You're all very, very welcome to this, the first of our webinars, the first of two webinars. Um, anyway, just uh, briefly a little bit about myself. As I say, my name is Manuel McGivern. I am a teacher, a retired teacher from Belfast. I, uh, I spent most of my, well, all my career with 33 years teaching in, in one particular school. I taught at level religion, but also um, I was part of uh, a, a senior management team that, that tried to provide strategies to create a, a culture of care in those schools. And I could see that sort of, you know, a culture of care where pupils felt valued and where they felt all their needs were being met. And I could see very much that, that this culture of care helped to transform not only the pupils, but also the schools. And so I'm, I'm quite convinced that, that this, uh, what we're going to hear tonight about building a culture of care and daring to care, I'm quite convinced also that it, uh, it will have great benefits for society as a whole. Um, but just to contextualize, to contextualize the evening, um, or just to say that also one final piece of tech information. If you um, want to write anything on it, the chat box will be open, but it will only be visible to the host and the technical team. So uh, we'll keep it open, uh, especially during Lorna's talks, uh, some of the other talks as well. You may want to comment, you may want to ask a question at the second half of the, the webinar. But uh, please, please, please feel free to, to type away. If you don't see it coming up, it's because it's it's not visible to everyone because sometimes these things can be a bit of a distraction, as you know. Anyway, on to the webinar proper. To contextualize this evening, we are here at the moment to, to talk about care and in particular to talk about uh, a culture of care as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, today, in Ireland and in Northern Ireland, we've seen the first openings of, of, of um, maybe some shops, some non-essential retail, and we're beginning to maybe see each other a bit more. Um, so it's perhaps a good time to reflect on what we have come through, and maybe more important to think about where we are going. Um, as you know, as we all know, when we look at the TV, we have seen economies throughout the world shrinking. We have seen uh, millions of jobs lost. We have seen unbelievable suffering, the scenes of, of our fellow human beings in hospitals suffering terribly. Indeed, um, some people say rich people appear to be getting richer and poor people appear to be getting even poorer. And on top of all that, we have the arrival of this new, this new thing called uh, vaccine nationalism, where some countries appear because of their wealth, they appear to be able to jump the queue as far as vaccines are concerned, while poor countries um, are left completely behind. And in these days as well, I, I think of all the, all the classrooms, the thousands of classrooms throughout the country that, are, that have been closed, and the hundreds of thousands of untaught lessons uh, and indeed all those, all those students of every age who have had their life and their education disrupted. But um, COVID has also presented us, or the pandemic has also presented us with some opportunities. Some people during the pandemic have been able to maybe slow down just a little bit. And in slowing down, they've been able to, to reconnect, possibly reconnect with families, reconnect with their communities, and. Uh, also most definitely to reconnect with nature. And I, I have read also, and I've become quite aware that it's almost like there's a new consciousness at the moment, you know, consciousness that's going from that ego consciousness where we all think, you know, by me, 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 to a possibly, to possibly a more global, uh, universal, even God consciousness that thinks instead of me, 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 thinks of us. But some people have been able to reconnect. Other people during the pandemic also have been able to, to try some new things, like maybe baking something new, like maybe gardening. I myself took up running in a big way, and it certainly was one way to, to, uh, to deal with everything. And then other people have been very creative and invented new ways of, of, they have implemented new ways of doing things. 
But this is, um, this is only one part of the context of this evening's webinar, because we have all come through that. We have all come through that. And then, of course, there is the, the digitalization of, of everything. You know, um, there's still a lot of big steps to be made, but a lot of people are being, are being linked up digitally. So that certainly is a good thing. And I heard someone say recently there as well that, you know, the, the family that zooms together stays together. It used to be, of course, as you know, the family that prays together stays together. But I heard it said, mentioned the family, the family that zooms together stays together these days. But anyway, this is where we're at at the moment. And for me personally, when I reflect on the year that's just gone by, I think it has been a period for me of, of isolation and also of, of more connection a period of light and a period of dark, a period of good times and bad times, and also a period of, um, of hope and despair. And what I love about this whole, uh, what I love about this CARE uh, program that we're looking at this evening and about the Dare to Care, it seems to bridge that gap, I think. It seems to me that it bridges that gap between uh, hope and despair between good times and bad times, between uh, light and dark. And um, I'm very much looking forward to hearing what we have with us this evening. We have one of the colossus of uh, the Dertikara movement. We have Conlet with us, and he uh, is one of the people who helped to launch the Dertikara movement last year. Hey, Manuel, lovely to be here. You can, you can hear me okay? Okay, yeah. Conlet, I wonder, Ken, it would be great. I know you're one of the, you're one of the people who helped launch the Dare to Care campaign, which is part of the Focolari movement, of course. Uh, and uh, maybe you can tell us a wee bit about what is, what is this Dare to Care campaign all about, Conlet, please? Yes, Manuel, thanks uh, so much. And it's so great uh, to see uh, everyone here tonight. Uh, so as many of you know, um, the Dare to Care campaign was launched last June to an online audience from uh, thousands of people from all over the world. And basically, it's a campaign that's made up of thousands of individual and collective commitments of, from people all around the world and communities all around the world who want to put care first. And I've recently had the chance to speak with many of the people who've made these, these commitments in the last year. And in their experiences that they've been telling me, they've been answering that your question manual, what is Dare to Care all about? And so I'd like to share a thread that's run through all of those conversations. And, and what it's been is that we all know how care feels. So we know how to receive care and we know how to give care. And it's that feeling, that ordinary everyday feeling that people return to and they come back to every time whenever they express Dare to Care. We know what it takes to dare to care in our everyday lives with our family, with our friends, our colleagues or our communities. And in Dare to Care, the campaign, we recognise those values that, that make up care, responsibility, courage, attention, thoughtfulness, perseverance, so many more values. And we're saying that those values should be reflected in our politics, in our citizenship, in our economies and in our society. So what this campaign is saying is that same feeling that we could feel now, uh, uh, that feeling of care, should be the same one that we feel whenever we interact with our politics or when we act as citizens. So it's a campaign that starts with that big vision first, and then we work out how to get there. So how did this campaign come about? So whenever we started planning for this campaign about a year ago now, we saw a world in crisis, a health crisis, an economic crisis, a climate crisis, a food crisis, a racism crisis. And almost a year on, it feels like not much has changed. The need for a new perspective, a new way of making decisions, a new status quo, a new way of thinking about things is still needed. And most recently, like you said, Manuel, the challenge of vaccine nationalism, the rise of vaccine nationalism, the worsening economic crisis or the beginnings of feeling the impact of the huge economic crisis and the continuing climate crisis are all continuing to call for that new perspective. And we in this campaign are saying that that perspective should be care. It's because of what you said exactly, Manuel, that bridge between despair and hope, between the old normal and the new normal, between the old normal that we don't want to return to and the new normal that we want to embrace. 
So it's also because care is a practical, practically speaking, care unites us. We, in order to care, we need to join together with, with a group of people. We need to team up with others. And our argument is that if we put care at the centre, our world is going to become more united. So our way to building a more united world is by putting care first. Um, care is a very broad concept. You see these very broad challenges here. So what we've been building over the last year is um, various lessons, workshops, moments of discussion to try and, and build up all of those um, to build a response to, to these challenges. So we've been looking at listening and dialogue, equality and equity, fraternity and the common good participation and co-governance and also the planet. So we've been looking at workshops, they're all available on the United World Project website. Um, and there have been many discussions in Ireland and in places all over the world um, where th those discussions have happened. So how have people been making this commitment? So in every pathway, there are three steps. So this is the an annual campaign of the United World Project. Uh, and every year there's three steps. Everybody makes a commitment to learn, act and share. So in the learn, there's been lessons, dialogues, workshops and discussions, as I've said, from all over the world. And our focus on here is, is, is kind of twofold. It's learning how to act. So it's learning so that we can put these things in action. But it's also developing. A, and, and the way in which we do that learning is through a head, hands, hearts approach. So it's kind of a, a, a comprehensive or integral way of learning. But the other thing is that we recognise that change happens in the world, not only through practical actions and concrete actions, which are very important, but also through new ideas, ideas that change the agenda. And so we've been looking a part of a big part of this campaign is also looking at those ideas and those narratives that can change the way people think. The second step that we have is ACT, and um, it's about going out to our local communities, teaming up with other people, seeing where we can put care at the centre, responding to those needs. And if you let me, I'd like to share just a snippet of stories from all over the world where there have been really, really inspiring stories of action. So in New Zealand, uh, the Dare to Dare group there are working with the Maori community near Wellington to restore a piece of natural heritage um, in, in, the Welling, in the greater Wellington area. In Wallace and Fortuna in the Pacific Ocean, another uh, Dare to Care group are working there to look after their local environment and unite the two previously warring kingdoms in, in that part of the world. In Congo, a young lawyer is fighting corruption in his city at great personal risk, inspired by the Dare to Care campaign. In El Salvador, a community activist called Ellie is building a road to her rural community to make it more connected to the, the more urban uh, spaces of employment and education. In Colombia, a young politician has been that, in, that was involved along with me in building the Dare to Care campaign has now taken on the role as Assistant Secretary of Housing in Bogota, um, a city of 10 million people dealing with huge challenges as a result of the, the COVID pandemic. In Austria, a group of people are building a program called Food to Connect, which uh, seeks to integrate uh, immigrants and refugees uh, into the, the city in, in rural Austria. And in the US, people are teaming up in pairs in the body system to overcome political polarization. So all over the world, people have been inspired by Dare to Care and they've been putting it into practice. And that action is at a key part of, of the campaign. And tonight in Ireland, you'll hear stories about that as well. The final step is share. Um, and tonight is one of these opportunities to share our ideas, our experiences. Um, and it's also our path to impact because this is a campaign to be shared with others. And so we want to build a huge coalition of people who want to put care first and want to dare to care together. We can also do this on social media and through the hashtag and through using the hashtag dare to care. In a nutshell, to your question, Manuel, that's how we are daring to care this year. Well... That's quite a nutshell, Kamla. Thank you very, very much. That's very helpful and very clear. Thank you. And I'm particularly impressed with that idea that care can help build a united world. I like that very much. Thank you. So, as you said there, part of the whole program is, is sharing. And we're going to share a couple of experiences now from young people. We have a video clip. The first one is from Killeen and his dad and uh, how they embrace the dirt to care pathway in a forest locally. And the second one is from Isabel, who, who uh, was very keen on sport. And she, uh, what she and her family did, they transformed sport in order to raise funds for poor people. I think it was in Haiti. 
So we're going to just uh, look at these, these two, this video clip now. Thank you. Okay, my name's Clemens. This here is Killian, my helper. And there were three of us, myself, Killian and Dan, we collected lots of plastic in this forestry last summer. Now the forest had about 2,000 of these plastic bags scattered over a big area. Uh, these bags, the forestry plants came in them and the planters in 1995, when they planted the trees, when the bag was empty, they threw it away. And 25 years later, we gathered up all the bags. So uh, it took us two days to do that. Okay, Killian, get the bag. Get the bag here. Here's the bag. Collect up all the plastic. Okay. This is like an Easter egg hunt. Killian, can you see the one over there? Killian, you go for that one. Okay. Um, so we have all the flags uh, gathered up. Uh, all this plastic will be recycled and actually it's going to recycling to Scotland where it's washed. From there it's made into little plastic pellets. The plastic pellets are sold to uh, China and the Chinese, we, so we're told, will make new toys for children out of the plastic. So the plastic that was lying here for 25 years, which did not decompose over 25 years, should turn into toys for children in China. That is the plan. Okay, so we'll say goodbye. Killian, do a wave. Bye. and decided to do something about it. One Saturday, we were running with our dad and we decided to do four marathons over four weeks for a friend of his, a Sister Rose, out in Haiti. These are some of the things Sister Rose does out there. One is she, he she helps pay for children's education because lots of parents out in Haiti are too poor to pay for their children's education so their children have to work. She also builds schools, uh, builds homes and builds businesses for women. <clears throat> At first we just told our family about it but then once we got into it we decided to tell our school. They, they raised some money for us and we were delighted. We raised over 2,000 euro for Haiti um, and a couple of weeks later Sister Rose sent us a beautiful letter and some lovely masks and a lovely cross and I have one here to show you. We were, we were so delighted with that um, and we were so proud of ourselves for finishing it. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> that's just beautiful. I don't know what I was doing when I was their age, but it certainly wasn't, wasn't that. That's so inspiring. So two wonderful examples of young people who have embraced the Dartica pathway. Well, now it gives me a great pleasure to, to uh, welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Lorna Gold. Um, Lorna is a specialist in international development who has worked in academic fields for the last two decades. She writes and speaks extensively on Pope Francis' teaching on Laudato Si. Indeed, she is a member of the Vatican Council's commission set up by Pope Francis uh, to look at the church's role in the pandemic. Um, I hope you don't mind me saying all these things, <laughs> Lorna. Lorna also has a, her PhD from uh, Glasgow University, and she currently lectures in applied social sciences in Maynooth. She has published widely, being the editor and author of numerous books, journals, policy reports, and academic papers. And perhaps she's uh, 
most widely known or best known for her book, Climate Generation, Awakening to Our Children's Futures. Um, she's a regular contributor um, to, uh, public, to the public debate on climate injustice in Ireland and international. Um, she is chair of the Global Catholic Climate Movement and a member of the Irish Government's Advisory Group in the National Climate Dialogue. She's originally from Scotland and is married. And I dare say her, her biggest achievement are her two young boys, whom I presume it being a school night or wrapped up of homeworks done, lunches made or uniforms folded, or maybe you're gonna do that one once this is over. Anyway, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Lorna Gold as our keynote speaker. Thanks, Manuel. Um, hi, everybody. It's just lovely to be here this evening with you all um, and to, to take part in this wonderful webinar on, on Dare to Care. Um, a lot has been said already about the pandemic and about care. So I'm just going to add some, some of my own reflections to that to help us to kind of dig a little bit deeper on what do we mean by um, a culture of care? And why is it so relevant and so important for us to embrace this culture of care um, at this particular moment in history? So I'm going to share my screen, hopefully now. Uh, here we are, so this one, okay. So when I'm asked to speak about the pandemic, um, I keep coming back to this wonderful quote by one of my favourite authors, Arundhati Roy, an Indian author, who gave this wonderful talk last year in the middle of the pandemic um, about the experience of pandemics down uh, throughout history. And she, she, she used this, the, this phrase, she said, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and to imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a, a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through it lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight. What I love about this, uh, this quote from, from Arundhati Roy is that it really helps us to see the momentous nature of the times that we're living in. Perhaps because we're so caught up in the minutia of it and the actual experience of this pandemic, which has shaken every single one of us, we don't grasp the momentous nature of the the, the, the historical period that we're actually living through. Because pandemics and other crises in the past have been times, as Arundhati says, of great change. And if you think even back to another huge crisis, the last global, truly global crisis, which was the Second World War, out of that crisis came a new uh, whole international order new ideas, human rights, the UN, international cooperation. What matters for us is that we can dare to see things differently. And that's truly what we want to do this evening. If I can move forward. <laughs> Another analogy that's used to describe the pandemic, which helps us to kind of situate where we are, is that it's a storm that we're facing. And the common analogy is that it's a storm and we're all in the same boat. And you hear that on the news all the time and you sense that we're all kind of in this together. But my good friend, Augusta Zampini, who is heading up the Vatican's COVID commission has used another analogy, which I really like. And that says that we, it's a storm, it's one storm, but we're actually in different boats. And the world that we're in today is a world where if you have a home, food and income, you're in a big boat in this storm and you might get a bit seasick, forced to change your daily routine during the storm. But by and large, 
not in fear of your life every day. But there are other people in this storm that are in tiny boats, some with very small motors, some with oars, some just completely out at sea at the whim of these great waves. Because the pandemic that hit us actually came on top of a world that had many pre-existing inequalities. And those inequalities are being perpetuated and reinforced by the pandemic. And in fact, I was interested that we're talking about emerging from COVID. When this crisis is actually, for the most part of the world, at its height. For those who, uh, yesterday I was talking to people in Armenia, where COVID is off the scale and nobody really cares. Likewise, yesterday in Turkey, they were talking about COVID rising. In Brazil, it is completely off the scale. So whilst we can be conscious and start in our own minds to think of the way out, we need to be truly mindful that this is something that is we're in the middle of. The storm is raging. Those of us who are close to shore are quite fortunate, but it's the ones who are left at sea that we need to be thinking about. Of course, as we're talking of getting back to normal, and I don't know how many times I say it to myself and to my husband every day, we wake up and we go, God, when can we get back to normal? It's natural. It's complete human instinct. We want to have the kind of the, the, the configurations of our life back to get back to some kind of normality. And it's almost like a hankering that we have inside us at this stage. Yet the old normal was very abnormal. And if we're truly to move forward into something new, we need to accept that and recognise it. And I always think of Greta Thunberg uh, as the one who kind of helped us to see in the year before the pandemic, the complete abnormality that we were actually living in. She, you could quote many quotes from Greta, but one that I love is she says, I want you to act as if the house is on fire because it is. And the fire of climate change and ecological destruction is still raging. It may have in some ways calmed down a little bit for us because we've, take, we've stopped so much during the pandemic, but it's not gone away. And these sleeping giants, as they're called, the tipping points of climate change, irreversible climate change, have continued to deteriorate over the past 18 months. Climate change, ecological destruction, inequality, pandemic. You might wonder what's the connection between all of these. Are they connected? And what has a culture of care got to do with all of this? The, at a very basic level, we can say that all of these crises that the world is facing today share a similar root. They're part of a paradigm that has dominated our thinking. Western globalized economic paradigm, which prioritizes growth of the economy, the monetary economy, at the expense of everything else. And this paradigm has become, let's say, detached from the physical, biological, social realities of the world that we are living in today. In some ways, it's become a bankrupt concept of economy. Because how can we be healthy if we're living on a sick planet? And if our economy predicates destruction of the environment? 
Because essentially, that's what our economy centred on growth, where growth has become the central focus of economic action. That is what it does. It might seem very complicated. How does all this fit together? But it gets very, very simple if you come down to trees. Think about trees. And I think lots of us, having had hundreds and hundreds of walks around the same trees and forests over the past year, might even have personal names for our favourite trees at this point. But the economy of trees is something fascinating. When you think of the context of COVID and the culture of care. What are trees? From an economic point of view, they only have a value if we can use them, and generally that means chopping them down and selling them and destroying the habitat. Yet trees are far more than that. Trees, apart from the enormous beauty that they give us. They also prevent diseases by being, become, being the custodians of the habitats for millions of species. They perform huge eco-services for the human race by providing us with oxygen. They're the most incredible carbon capture um, devices that exist on the planet. We don't really need to invent them. Carbon capture is what trees do for a living, if you want to put it that way. So our whole economic system, which predicates the destruction, the deforestation of huge, huge tracts of our uh, planet, is actually causing us to live on an unhealthy planet, increasingly unhealthy. It's not a side effect of our economy. It's the way our economy and our understanding of progress actually works. Of course, it's not the only understanding of progress. And one of the wonderful things that is emerging through the pandemic is that there are many alternative ways of thinking about human progress. Humanity at the moment is facing a profound fork in the road where we can essentially return to a culture and a way of doing business which is founded on a culture of unlimited growth, self-interest and indifference. Or we can move forward out of this pandemic into a different way of being in society which is based on nature clean energy, circularity, conscious consumption, sustainable investments, and an open source technology. But what is this dependent on? It's dependent on a culture of care because you cannot build that economy. It only thrives on, you cannot build it on a culture of unfettered growth and self-interest. It thrives, it grows, it flourishes where there's a culture of care and mutual interdependence. So the pandemic is a crisis we are facing in humanity, but it's also a kairos. The word kairos in Greek means an auspicious moment a moment for profound change. Because whereas before the pandemic, all of these wonderful ideas existed, they, they held no water. They were kind of, well, how could we ever possibly imagine an economy, a society based on care? And yet through the pandemic, we have learned in the most a visceral way, we've been shaken to our core by the understanding that care is what really matters. We have had forgotten our interdependence. 
the fact that we rely on each other to survive. And yet we now know in our hearts, because we've seen it in front of us, that there are people out there every day who give their lives for us, for complete strangers. We feel we owe them so much. They're the saints next door, as Pope Francis calls them. But that reality of care, of seeing what it means to care, what it means to risk your life, has changed everything or has the potential to change everything because it has reverberations that go far beyond the caring professions. It's created a new uh, consciousness, as I think it was Conleth that said. And each of us has our own story of how COVID has shaken us and COVID has changed us and opened us and moved us to care in different ways. And so the question now is, how do we build on that? How do we chip? transform what has been the caring of COVID and make it something that is the foundation for a new society and a new economy. I love this quote of Pope Francis because he often talks about this idea of a culture of care. Caring is a golden rule of our nature as human beings and brings with it health and hope. He also talks of the fact that this care that we're talking about has to be extended to the whole of creation. It's not just care for humans. It's an impulse, it's a culture, it's a lifestyle that we need to adopt. And I love the idea that we call it a culture of care. Someone might say, well, why not a culture of solidarity? I think care is something intimate. Care, as uh, Conley said, is something we can feel. We know what it means to be cared for. We know what it feels like to be cared for. So care is at the heart of a new culture we need to bring about. And in his wonderful book, which I highly recommend, called, um, it's gone out of my head now, Dear to Dare to dream, no, not dare to dream. <laughs> let us dream, let us dream. Pope Francis says we owe it to those who have given their lives in COVID and those who've um, protected others to build this culture of care. Building a culture of care that's truly universal calls on each of us to overcome and to widen our hearts. Pope Francis also calls it a generous culture of care because each of us has our own cares. We all have our own circles of care, but we have to confront ourselves to say, how can we widen our care and reach out to others? Some of us care for people, but not the planet. Care for the planet, but not the people. We care for some people and not other people. We care for others, but we neglect ourselves or we care for ourselves and not for others. And the challenge in the society in building a culture of care is to widen our sense of care, to embrace everyone and everything. So if we think about it as ripples of care, each of us can think practically then, how can we care? How and where can we care? And if we think about it, we need to care for ourselves, of course, and have self-care. We need to care for those closest in our home, our family, our friends. But we can't stop there. We need to move out into our communities and also into our political, economic and social institutions. So just briefly to touch on each of those, to give just some ideas, just suggestions on what a culture of care that embraces the planet and embraces each other looks like. At home, it could mean being attentive to each other, 
and how we use the Earth's resources each day. Becoming more mindful of all our purchases, minimising our waste, choosing sustainable caring alternatives in our energy, transport and food. If you think if you're lucky to have a garden, it's about how we care for the environment in our garden. Thinking about the caring for the pollinators, the wildlife that uses your garden as a home. It might be also about keeping alive the connections we cultivated during the pandemic. Manuel mentioned the family that Zooms together is certainly my experience, especially with older relatives. And then practicing self-care, the importance of spirituality, mindfulness, rest in nature and unplugging. In our communities then, how do we harness the newfound sense of rootedness in our neighbourhoods? Here it's about reaching out, about going beyond our comfort zones, seeking out those who are marginalised in our communities finding ways to connect with local groups as a volunteer, a fundraiser, a supporter. And if you spot a gap, why stop there? Start something. I have a, a good friend and a neighbour, for example, who during the pandemic spotted a, a gap in care for parents who were having chemotherapy. And out of that, she started a whole new charity called Community cancer caregivers to provide parents with care at their time of need. In his book, Pope Francis talks about this stepping out into our communities. And he says, if you don't know what to do, just drop one of your local groups a line and said, eh, he says, I've decided to start to build a new culture of care. And I was interested in your group and I thought I'd start here, which I thought was quite nice. And then when it comes to our political, economic and social institutions, it is only through this culture of care that starts to permeate upwards and starts to in integrate with our, uh, the public narrative that we can start, as Conley said, to put care on the agenda of major political decisions that are going to be made. We can do this in so many ways, as we've experienced through the work of Chokra and through other organisations, through raising our voices together that, to put forward policies that are centred on care, by asking politicians and voting for them only if they advocate and exemplify care in their actions, by generating dialogue on what a culture of care means in different settings, and importantly, using our consumer and investor power to vote with our wallets for those who care. Finally, I just want to mention somebody who I, many of you know and who has been, for me, one of the, the leading lights um, in calling on us to be protagonists of care. Sometimes it can feel in our world that that today that, they're, that we're overwhelmed and we don't quite know where to start to care. And Chiara Lubick, who founded the Folklari movement, her words always, I come back to them and they inspire me continuously. Because each of us has to be the first to make a start. Where you don't find love, put love, then you will find love. And we all have to believe that the tiniest stone can create great ripples of care. Thank you. Wow. Well, <clears throat> thank you very, very much, Lorna. That's, I hardly know what to say. That's uh, absolutely stunning. You speak about uh, the pandemic as a Kairos moment. I, I'm thinking for myself, your, your speech there is almost like a Damascus moment for me. It's uh, very, very beautiful. Thank you. Your enthusiasm, your passion, hopefully will, will inspire us this evening and, and as we move forward to, to, uh, to do something ourselves, to continue to do something and even more. Anyway, thank you, that was just beautiful. Um, I just wanna say also, can I remind, we have I think hundreds of people online, but can I remind you that the chat box is open if you want to make a comment or a reflection or ask a question of Lorna, a bit later on, just to remind you that that 
chat box is still open. Thank you very much. So we move on. And now we have a, a bit of a musical interlude. Um, no, it's not me singing. You'll be glad to hear. We have, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, with us, well, not live, but a recording of Jen Verde. Jen Verde or, or a, um, an international performing group. And they're going to sing a song called Turnaround. And in this song, uh, they encourage us all to take steps, concrete steps, collective steps, to do something to save our planet. came back from the moon with the stars in his eyes he said up there i learned a lot something changes inside when you see the earth rise got no boundaries and no walls that living breathing ball love is underneath it all With the fire in her eyes She said, hey, something's really wrong Deserts grow, people die While the oceans rise She said, can't you see the urgency? You pretend that you care Then you look away You are trapped in all our hopes and dreams We can't wait for a change Got to start today You can feel it in the breeze You touch it in the trees You hear the waterfall That is underneath it all It's running in the fields You swim it in the deep Beneath the blue and green Connecting everything Oh, yeah, I believe it isn't too late To turn around Oh, yeah, I believe it isn't too late Thank you, Jan Verdi. Uh, that was beautiful. Uh, as this evening is progressing, one thing seems quite clear to me. I think that uh, care for our neighbor and not caring for the planet, for the earth, is not an option, it seems to me. Anyway, we move on. 
As we said at the start of the webinar, um, this is a joint venture, and now I'm delighted, we're delighted to welcome our two other speakers, Jen Mellet, who is the Laudato C officer for Tropra, and Noreen Lynch, who works with the Margaret Aylward Center, which is a center for faith and dialogue in Dublin. And they are going to uh, share with us some of their ideas also about, about developing, building a culture of care. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good evening, everybody. Delighted to be here this evening. And Lorna, thanks so much for your, your wonderful talk. There's just so much to think about and to take away. Um, and I'm just going to share some um, thoughts that I had as I was reading and, and listening to, uh, to Lorna's talk this evening. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here. Hopefully you can you can see that OK. And um, Lorna mentioned Pope Francis's um, new book, Let Us Dream, and, and she also had a, a wonderful quote from Aaron Dati Roy around the pandemic being a portal, a, a threshold. Um, and just this quote from, from Pope Francis uh, came, came to mind from his new book, where he says, to enter into crisis is to be sifted. He says, your categories and, and ways of thinking get shaken up. Your priorities and lifestyles are challenged. You cross a threshold, either by your own choice or by necessity. And the basic rule of a crisis is that you don't come out of it the same. If you get through it, you come out better or worse, but never the same. And uh, I think we can all maybe relate to that um, from our experience of the past year and, and the COVID-19 pandemic. And it has really forced us into a space where, where we're, we're thinking about what's important. Um, and just to quote Pope Francis again, on January 1st this year, he, he gave a wonderful address for the World Day of Peace on creating a culture of care. And he said it's a way to combat the culture of indifference. And, and Lorna highlighted many of, of the injustices that COVID has highlighted from, uh, from the destruction of our, our ecosystems to the injustices around the different types of boats we're in as we navigate through this, this storm. Um, and, and Pope Francis says, it's, it's a way, creating a culture of care is a way to combat the culture of indifference, waste and confrontation so prevalent in our time. So creating a culture of care, he says, is the path to peace. And he highlights in that speech, um, different aspects of Catholic social teaching that he says we can use as a compass to create this culture of care. So things like care is promoting the dignity and rights of each person, care for the common good, for solidarity, care and protection of creation. And he urges everyone in society, government leaders, international organization, businesses, scientists, educators, to take up these principles and to use them as a compass. So that image of us navigating our way through this crisis um, to point out a common direction and a more humane future. So just that idea of us trying to find our path and our way using this, this compass uh, to create a culture of care. And he says there can be no peace without a culture of care. Um, and Lorna highlighted that, you know, to care, it goes deeper than a sense of, of duty. Um, it, it involves a, a deep love for, for one another and for the earth. And this, the source of this vocation to care, um, in the book of Genesis, we see that in the very first pages, um, the importance of care in God's plan for humanity. And quotes that we're very familiar with, but when we look more closely at them, um, we're entrusted with this planet to till it and to keep it, to protect it and preserve its capacity to support life. And um, the first commandment that we were ever given was to be guardians of all of creation. And Pope Saint Francis says that everything is interconnected. Genuine care for our own lives and our relationship with nature is inseparable from fraternity, justice and faithfulness to others. So this is all deeply interconnected. And Lorna used that lovely image of the economy of trees. And I think we've all kind of connected with nature in a different way during this pandemic. And this quote from the Dado Sea came to mind, inviting us to see nature as a magnificent book in which God speaks to us and grants us 
a glimpse of his infinite beauty and goodness. And I just was thinking about, as well as our care for creation, how we create this culture of care in our own lives. And this young man came to mind. Many of you will be familiar with the Late Late Toy Show, which is a bit of an Irish institution as we prepare for Christmas every year. Um, children of all ages <laughs> gather in their pajamas around the TV to, to watch this toy show. It's a bit of a, a national institution. And back in November last year, this, this lovely young boy, Adam King, appeared on the Late Late Toy Show. And he brought with him a hug, a virtual hug for everyone. And he, this virtual hug went viral. It just became a, a national sensation. And Adam has additional needs. He's in a wheelchair. He has brittle bones. But he just warmed, warmed the hearts of the nation with his virtual hug for all. And it, it took off. Um, on post the National Postal Service in Ireland used his virtual hug image that he had created as the postmark for, for letters that were zooming around the country. Um, so anytime you received a, a bit of posts in Ireland, uh, Adam's hug for you was, was on, on, this, on, on, your, on your letter or your postcard. It was just a lovely way of connecting everyone around this virtual hug that Adam had created. And Adam had said on the show that he wished to be an astronaut or to work in mission control in NASA. And when NASA heard this, they started tweeting about Adam's virtual hug and his adventurous spirit. And they said, you know, there's space for everyone at NASA. We can't wait for Adam to, to be here one day. To, that they're promoting, um, creating these teams of, of dreamers. So NASA got involved in Adam's virtual hug. And then Adam's virtual hug started to appear on street art around, around Dublin. And different um, shops and, and chains created a, an actual card of Adam's virtual hug that you could send to people. So on Mother's Day, on St. Patrick's Day, these virtual hug cards were zooming around the, co the country. So when I was thinking about how we dare to care, Adam certainly came into my mind because I just thought this was such a, a moment where the whole country kind of became connected around Adam's virtual hug and um, just the simple gestures that can capture a nation and, and can help us feel more connected to one another. And in the Dado Sea, Pope Francis says, we regain the conviction, we must regain the conviction that we need one another. We have a shared responsibility for others and the world. And there's this beautiful image in the Dado Sea that he, he takes from St. Therese of Lisieux and he inviting us to practice the little way of the little ways of love and not to miss out on a kind word, a smile or a gesture which sows peace and friendship. And that's certainly something that, that Adam's virtual hug did and that we're all called to do. And Pope Francis says this has a ripple effect. And Lorna spoke about these ripple effects in our homes and communities as well. So love overflowing with small gestures of mutual care is civic and political. It makes itself felt in every action that seeks to build a better world. Um, but these actions, when they express self-giving love, they can also become intense spiritual experiences. So to never underestimate um, the power of these small actions and the ripple effect that they have throughout the community. So just to finish with Pope Francis, um, he says, peace, justice and care for creation are three inherently connected questions which can't be separated. There's no peace without a culture of care. And he says, to come out of this crisis better, we have to see clearly, choose well and act right. And he says, let's talk about how, let us dare to dream. So I leave it there and hand over to, to Noreen. It's lovely to be here. And in, in many ways, uh, we have heard so much good stuff now from, from Gomez, from Lorna, from the young people, from Jane, that I'm almost repeating what has been said in the hope that perhaps some of the ideas might strike you. And uh, so thank you for, for still listening. It's, you have great patience. And I'm just going to share one quote and two points that just struck me in listening to what Lorna was saying um, and to see if it's helpful for you. I hope it is. So I was very struck by the Aaron Doherty Roy quote, which I think a lot of people are. I've used it a few times uh, across the pandemic. I found it really helpful to go back to the idea that pandemics have forced humans to break with the past. That this is a moment that is 
absolutely specifically different that we are walking through a gateway, not the same. Uh, and I suppose what stays with me is the notion that we can choose how we walk through this gateway. That in many ways, we don't feel like we have a lot of choices. That our sense of this time is that things are being done to us and we don't have choices and we are under pressure. And when we get time, we will, we will think about it. And in some ways, that's that sense. We can drag all the, the baggage of how the world must be um, what bills we must pay, how we must keep things going, how society must work. We can drag all that like a carcass, as Arundhati Roy says, um, across, or we can step back and try and walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. And there's something quite different between imagining another world and being ready to fight for it. There are two, two things. And I'd suggest that a culture of care or daring to care is going to involve us both having the passion to fight for something, but also to have the imagination to dream about what might be possible. And as we do that, some of what we're called to do is to, to let go of our baggage or our stories about the way the world must be and to start to imagine the world the way God plans it to be, the way God hopes for it to be. So my question for us at the end of listening to to Conrad, to Lorna, to Jane, to all of the, the, the great speakers tonight is, how can I let go of the baggage that I'm bringing with me to this that says to me, it's a lovely idea to dare to care, but would it really work? But it's too hard, but I wouldn't know where to start. How do I let down that baggage? And I'm going to make two suggestions briefly. I'm going to start by talking about trees, as everybody has. Um, because for me, I would have always felt I had a, a connection with trees, a sense of, of the beauty of trees and the importance. And much like this little image here, I would have thought about how great and useful trees were, how functional they were, how, how precious they were, how they held the soil on the side of a hill, how they gave a home to birds. And about two years ago in the, the beautiful Margaret Aylward Centre where I work, we're in amazing grounds. And there are trees that are up to 250 years old, planted by gentry who were there before the Holy Faith Sisters, planted in beautiful walks. And we often have on Culture Night a walk around the grounds and we admire the trees and we hear the history. And about two years ago, a um, friend, Brenda, uh, said that I asked her to would she do that walk for us, but instead of focusing on the Latin names and the history, would she talk about at some sense of spirituality uh, or the ecology around this. And so Brenda, as she walked, she stood under an Irish oak that was about 200 years old. And she said, this tree is about 200 years old. It has probably about 50,000 leaves in it. And this tree breathes in and out every day and water vapor rises from its leaves. About 10% of the water we have as human beings in our clouds in our world comes from trees. So she said, I want you to imagine for a moment where the tree, where the water from this tree is gone, where the water from this tree is today. She said, maybe there's a thirsty bird sipping from a pool. Maybe your shower this morning contained water that was gifted to you by a tree. She said, maybe in the sacrament of baptism somewhere in the world, the water that is poured on a child or an adult said, came from a tree that gave us water. And I found myself moving from a place of viewing trees, seeds, nature as something that was there to help me to know about the beauty of God in, into simply by their existence, they are gorgeous and beautiful and precious in God's eyes. That in some way, God who wanted us to know all of what the divine world contained, God who wanted us to know love said, there is something of God you cannot know without seeing a tree. There is something of God revealed in a flower, in a plant. And so I suggest that as we find ourselves a bit overwhelmed and wondering how to move forward with this, this culture of care, that one thing that can help us is to move beyond function into wonder and awe. Instead of thinking, what will we do? What must be done? How do we build into our day time to be in awe of the world about us? Time to see our fellow creatures, animals, plants, that the world has created and placed here with us. That in that understanding of the world, in that gentle way of being with the world, instead of seeing the world is useful, in that way of noticing trees, of walking among the flowers as they change in each month, we begin to understand that this is not about fixing the world, it is about fully living in the world and being present in this world. And that helps us to dare to care, 
because we care for those we love. We care for the planet that we love. If we're to move into this sense of the spiritual transformation, really, and to see the world with wonder and awe, it involves us also seeing our brothers and sisters with wonder and awe. And so the second challenge I would make is that we move beyond charity into solidarity. And I think Pope Francis has some beautiful things about, char about uh, charity in um, Fratelli Duty and, uh, and, and LFC. But he talks about politics too must make room for the tender love of others. And we don't often hear the word politics and tender love in the same sentence. Um, and yet somehow we're called that in our political decisions, in our big choices about how the world works and how we live, that at the heart of it as Christians, we would live out of a place of tender love, that we would not separate and say, here I have my political hat on, here I have my economic or my business hat on, but I would say that all of what I do lives in that sense of the tender love of others. He also talks about believing in a happy future, a better tomorrow. It's not that we have to go back to the Stone Age. Slowing down, recovering values, the meaning of life is not about uh, destroying and stopping what was great. It's about actually saying that what happens to all my brothers and sisters, this image is from Brazil, is, is not about me saying, well, what can I give from what is excess from my charity? But rather, how can I recognize that when the people of Brazil are broken, I am broken too. That when the people of different parts of the world cannot get healing and hope, then somehow I am sick and unwell too. And we will not be well until all of us are well. We will not be safe until everyone is safe. And I'm going to offer two very simple examples. Not that you have to definitely follow, but to, to kind of help us to think, how do we get beyond thinking in the small world of there is only so many things we can do? We must drag the carcass of the old ways with us. This is the way the world must be. How do we get beyond that into thinking about God's plan for the world, living with light luggage? And I'm going to suggest the first one is a very simple idea that has been uh, shared widely, that we would share our vaccines. Uh, Mike Ryan says from WHO, let's say once the vulnerable are vaccinated, 10% of all vaccines should go around the world to people who can't get vaccines. Um, others say, let the technology for vaccine be openly available. America and Europe are holding that back because we feel this, you can't just share stuff for nothing. So let's have an imagination like God's that says, let's leave go the, the story that there must be a profit. Let's leave go the story of it can't possibly be shared. And let's consider something different. Then here's another kind of edgy idea. Uh, in Ireland, um, this week, we changed our rules from people could travel within five kilometers and now they can travel much wider. One of the things that changed in the law was the rule around evictions changed. As soon as we, couldn't, as soon as we could travel more than five kilometers, landlords can now evict people who can't pay their rent. And we live at the moment in a culture where a lot of people don't have cash, they don't have jobs. So there's going to be a huge rise in homelessness in Ireland in the next month or two, quite a substantial rise. A lot of people are going to be put out of rented accommodation. And so the Jesuit Center for Faith and Justice offered an idea, quite a radical idea. They said, we have had jubilees before. Could we have a rent jubilee in Ireland? Could we dare to care enough to say, we need to completely rethink all of this conversation about rent and housing and homelessness? Now, I'm not saying I agree with that, but I'm saying imagine living so lightly in the world that where all the stories of what can't be done come into our head, we say, what is God's will? How can we care for one another in this? Can we have a different conversation than it can't be done, but step back into a conversation that says, I want to come through this portal, this gateway, this Kairos moment, and live in a new and different way. I want to be able to consider ideas that are biblical, that are exciting, that are challenging, and not say it can't be done, but say, this is a new time now, and we're ready to imagine a new way of living, and we're ready to fight for it. It's been great to be here this evening. I look forward to all that you're about to do. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very, very much, Noreen and Jane. That has so many pearls of wisdom, really there, given us a lot to think about. So beautiful, thank you. Um, we move on now. We have Time's flying by. We have a, a video now. We're going to get to know Francesca Operti. Francesca is from Belfast. And uh, during the pandemic, she 
find she had a lot of time, well, some time off work, and she found a way of putting her talents to good use for those in Belfast less fortunate. So this is uh, another video. Thank you. Hi, I'm Francesca. I'm a software engineer and I work and live in Belfast. Um, when I heard about um, Dare to Care project, I really like it and I think it really fits well with my own outlook on life. In summer 2020, after three months of full-time full furlough, I, I was really ready to go back to work. And um, But when I heard that for an uncertain number of months, I would have still be in part-time furlough, um, I really felt the need to do something useful and engaging. Um, so the first thing that came to mind was uh, Tools for Solidarity. It's a Belfast-based uh, charity that I got to know via Repair Cafe Belfast, that I usually volunteer with. Tools for Solidarity for the past 35 years, um, they refurbish and repair uh, power tools, sewing machines, um, and they prepare shipments um, for different parts of Africa, and they help local people to start, develop, and sustain their own sewing, uh, woodwork, and masonry business. And they were delighted of my proposal to volunteer, even though I'm not a, a, a trained volunteer for that kind of, of that kind of work because my background is quite different. But they were delighted because they, some of the international volunteer had to leave because of the pandemic. And so I started to volunteer two days per week. It was a challenging time because of the type of job, quite different from what I know, um, from the social distance restrictions in place, and also a completely different setup from what I'm, I'm used to volunteering to. Um, but it was really an enriching time, and um, especially see how uh, a different setup, but well established, to, re to respond to a particular set of needs enriches you and, and, and really helps a certain part of the society, people that you wouldn't otherwise reach. So I really think after that uh, time there that cooperation and collaboration between different charities and people is really necessary, if not indispensable. Another interesting collaboration happened at the beginning of this year. Um, um, Home Plus, a Belfast-based charity, where um, that tries to break the cycle of homeless uh, people and sleeping rough, uh, extended their services to help with homeschooling. Um, the different aspects of homeschooling, and they had donated some devices that needed to be fit for homeschooling and sometimes even repaired. Um, Repair Cafe Belfast tried to answer to that SOS call and um, with the service of different volunteers that regularly uh, attend the Repair Cafe, the monthly events. So it was really going <laughs> to the extra mile for everyone involved because it's not really the kind of setup that we are used to and the kind of work and the restrictions didn't help and so on. Um, but at the end, some families received the devices that they needed and maybe it's not going to be a, a continuous collaboration, uh, but really is another example of how uh, working together is really a necessary thing. And personally, I don't know what I, or how I'm going to put into actions the things that I've learned during the pandemic, but I'm quite sure that I will put those skills at the service of others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesca. That was beautiful um, as well. Another example of, of the daring to care in practice um, and building a culture of care. At this point, we were going to have, and there have been a lot of questions that come in for Lorna and the other contributors and a lot of uh, comments as well. But if we could just ask Lorna to come back on stage. As I say, we're not, we have heard so many beautiful things this evening, so much stuff. We were going to have some questions, but we're kind of running out of time. There have been some questions. 
And we've had some beautiful comments. Here's a message from Sweden from someone who's very touched by the whole webinar and all the contributors. Um, another person has said the talk is fantastic and wants to share it with the whole world. So there's been a lot of very sort of positive comments and questions that if we had more time, we would certainly ask you for questions, uh, a question and answer session. But we were wondering, apparently all good webinars uh, have to have three memorable things, three memorable takeaways. So I hope I'm not putting you too much on the spot. You've already done so much for us, Lorna. And uh, we were wondering if perhaps you could share three memorable things for us from, from this evening or whatever that we could take away. So to help build a community and to build a culture of care. Yeah, thanks, Manuel. It's just been so, so lovely. People have been mm -hmm. sending me lots of little messages in the chat as well. Just um, so I think it's really uh, the, what we've said, myself, Jane, um, Noreen, Conleth, everybody, all, all the little videos has kind of really struck a chord with people. And I think everybody really feels they need time to reflect. And thankfully, I think this has been recorded. So uh, I'm sure it'll be shared afterwards. Um, three takeaways. Um, I think that, that all of us, the first one is that the, the pandemic is a crisis, but it's also a Kairos moment. So this is the opportunity. Like it's, it's, we're in an extraordinary time to, to, to break out of old ways of doing things. Um, I think the second one, the second takeaway is really trees <laughs> for some reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what I mean by that is that everything's interconnected. The, this challenge that we have is to throw open our hearts to a universal culture of care. So it's, as you said, it's not about caring for people and not the planet or the other way around. It's about seeing the interconnections and that trees are really, really beautiful and they're really important. And I think I really got that from what Noreen said. So I'm going to look at trees differently tomorrow. And the third thing I think is really that we can all start. Um, I think many of us, um, I'm sure lots of people in this webinar, including myself, like to think that care is what we do. <laughs> this, is, this is really what we like to think of uh, how we are, but we can always, start and look afresh at how we're caring um, and I think we can never stop being challenged by what we're seeing around the world and what that's saying to us and how what it means and how we need to care so they're my three takeaways thank you very much Lorna that's so helpful so Kara's moment trees interconnection and looking afresh at, at Karen thank you very very much I really appreciate that on behalf of everyone. So all that remains for me to say, we're coming near the end of this webinar. Uh, first thing we want to do is to, uh, it's like a save the date. On the 8th of May, we have the second of our webinars. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, there you have it. 8th of May, and it's from 12 noon until 1 p.m. We would like to invite everyone to that. We have Dr. Tom Healy, as you see there, the economist and author of An Ireland Worth Working For, who is our guest speaker, alongside, like we've had this evening, concrete experiences of applying a culture of care in various social contexts. So if you would like to put that in your diary, please. And uh, I'd just like to mention as well that it's part of the international Dare to Care event, which Connett mentioned earlier. This, so it's the 8th of May, 12 noon to 1 p.m. Please join us then. We would be delighted if you would be able to. Anyway, there'll be more information on that. And all that remains for me to say now, and we're finishing in good time. As it says on, the, says on the program here, 2057, and it is funny enough, 2057. <laughs> I can, can hardly believe it. But all that remains for me to do is to say a most heartfelt thank you to all our contributors, to Lorna, to Noreen, to Conleth, to Jane, to our people who contributed via video links, videos, to, uh, to show us concrete examples of how to put Dare to Care in action. I'd also like to thank the, the Dare to Care team here. That's, of course, Elizabeth and Brendan and Marion and Rail and 
We cannot, of course, leave out our wonderful tech team, Maria Rosa, behind the scenes, working so hard to make sure everything went as smoothly as it did. So I just want to wish everyone a heartfelt good night. Take care. God bless. And see you on the 8th of May. Thank you.